the client is not forcing you into anything. It's not his fault that you set very low pricing that doesn't allow yeah. you to become profitable. Amir Halzen is the founder of WPML, the leading multilingual plugin that's used by over a million websites. There's all these sort of human behaviors that I think are more important to understand when you're thinking about pricing than 2% or 3%. Hmm. WPML was a freemium plugin. Amir and his team decided to only make a premium product. People don't like to pay for what they're not using. How did you not make people pay for something they didn't want to use? We keep putting in features and taking out features, things which made out of sense seven years ago. Nobody needs them today, they're just extra luggage now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Plugin.fm. Today's guest tackled a business model shift that transformed his company for the better. Amir Halzen is the founder of On The Go Systems, the company behind WPML. In this episode, we're going to dive into the challenges and dynamics of taking product from freemium to premium successfully, how to keep trust and community buy-in, and how to change your market positioning and pricing. It is not all about the tactics. There are a lot of foundational issues that we discuss in this episode. Amir, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hello, Patrick. All right, I'm ready to go. Um, so I want to I want to get started with just I think it's it's helpful to understand your entrepreneurial journey before WPML. So how, how did you start as a software creator and how how did you eventually get to WPML? Um, I really wanted to have a business. I've been doing this since I was a teenager, basically, and um, I was looking for opportunities. I was looking for what I could do to have a little business. And uh, I wasn't working in software before that. I was a hardware engineer, an electronics engineer. And actually, I was working for something which requires a whole lot of infrastructure, where every round for releasing a product costs millions, millions of dollars. Wow. And that you don't do by yourself. You've got to be part of a big business. Mm -hmm. um, and I was actually even responsible for a few very expensive bugs. Two bugs, which I personally didn't catch, and I, I caused, I think, cost in total over a million dollars to, to the company I worked with. Yeah, quite a lot. Whoa! Whoa. Uh, and, uh. Yeah. But then, the saddle, the saddle thing, which was a lot of money. At that time, it was a lot of money for us. The company uh, closed down, and it wasn't because of me. It wasn't mm -hmm. because of my mishaps. That's another thing which I learned. It, will, it was because of uh, incorrect management decisions. Hmm. We had an excellent manager, a very nice person, which I, I, I really adored. Uh, but he, he liked uh, technical things more than he enjoyed um, management work. Mm -hmm. He was a great engineer, mm -hmm. and he really, really liked being part of the product development. Mm -hmm. Which means means nobody was running running the business. Nobody was doing mm -hmm. his job. Mm -hmm. And that was a very expensive, a very interesting lesson for me to kind of control myself later on. So I had to apply this lesson mm -hmm. years, years later, but it was deep in my head because it was a business that I loved. I really mm -hmm. liked working in that business. Uh, so I had all these uh, you know ups and downs, and I want I knew what I wanted, and. Um, I did several attempts on my own to create something. And uh, yeah, now we've got uh, on-the-go systems. How did you get into like WordPress or was that in, in like I, website development? Uh, for, one of, for one of my initiatives, I needed mm -hmm. a website. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I think that uh, WordPress just got pages. Um, it had posts just uh -huh. until then. And as soon as WordPress got pages, uh, it became possible to create a website with WordPress, and I created the little website for my little enterprise on WordPress. Um, and it was at the time when uh, me and my family were living in uh, southern uh, Argentina, okay. in Patagonia. Um, so um, the business, the, the website, had to speak uh, English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. English because I knew it, and Spanish because everyone else knew it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we were working on solutions. My first iteration was actually uh, to have uh, several websites and do some uh, PHP hacking 
Mm-hmm. So that would control the, the site language and the, the instance of WordPress you're launching. That was pre-multisite. I don't know that multisite existed that at that time. Wow! Little hack, you know, instead of the sunrise script that runs uh, with a multisite, mm-hmm. I think yeah, we did that before before multisite came along. Okay. Um, there was some role in uh, Apache to parse the URL. And from that, figure out which WordPress site to run. Give it a part of the URL for the page. Keep the rest for the for the which website to run. One was in English. One was in uh, Spanish. Mm-hmm. It worked great. And that experience uh, showed me the shortcomings of using multiple sites per languages. Mm. Um, I can go through a whole list, but there is a whole list, and you need to run it yourself in order to to see it yourself. Yeah. Uh, and I was looking for solutions. There was one solution available at that time. Uh, I think it was Qtranslate mm-hmm. by someone who was doing a great job volunteering his time, but I didn't like the way it uh, it approached uh, it approached storing languages, mm-hmm. storing translations for the content. Um, I, I I I started uh, creating our own, and it was a, it wasn't a plugin. It wasn't anything. It was. Um, some PHP files that we would run for ourselves just to make our site multilingual. And when it actually worked, I said, well, okay, I will publish it on WordPress.org as a plugin. And then that plugin became um, a vehicle for actually acquiring clients to a translation service, which uh, I started a little later. I had these two independent properties that, that plugin that I created for subs for, for my, my own need, and uh, we had the transition service. And I can, the, the, the obvious connection we've got something that can get can help people build sites, multilingual sites with WordPress. We're looking for people who need transition work. Oh, okay, okay, let's use it as a lead generation uh, method. WPL plugin, it went on wordpress.org. Uh, it, it did bring some leads. I was uh, surprised by uh, how few leads it managed to bring compared to how many people already mm. use that. I'm always curious, you know, like what, roughly what percentage, you know, if you have a, a thousand websites using WPML, did you get 10 leads? Yes, but out of these 10 leads, many weren't uh, big clients that could actually you could actually build a business from. Today we're working with big transition services who actually know what they're doing. Okay. So um, they're working with us with WPML to get clients for themselves. Mm-hmm. But they know better how to identify these clients. They know how better how to approach them and to make the WordPress translation a part of a larger package which they offer to their clients. Right. And now the partnership makes perfect sense to them also because it solves what they need. Yeah. Um, but just as a lead generation for people who are building sites and looking for plugins on WordPress.org, that was not incredibly efficient. It did allow the business to grow, so we go from just me to another one to another one. Mm-hmm. But I, I saw that we're, we're, we're getting limited here. We're mm-hmm. not going to grow that much from this mm-hmm. uh, plant source. There's one thing that Amir misses from being on WordPress.org, and it's essential to any business, especially new businesses. Listen on and see if you can figure it out. So WPML was a free lead generation. I mean, a free plugin that you used primarily for lead generation for translation yes. services. When did you decide to take it off of WordPress.org and then make it a, a only a paid plugin? I, w- I didn't decide. Uh, okay. two, two others made the decision for us. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, but I was, uh, I was lucky enough to pay attention to this. And to understand that we need to kind of join into this decision. Hmm. So we accidentally violated a requirement that we didn't know existed on the okay. WordPress plugin repository. Uh-huh. I think it was a relatively small thing. Uh-huh. Anyway, the policy at that time was if someone violates something, your product becomes a draft. You need to understand that at that time, it wasn't a big business like it is today. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a big deal, okay? I think today, if uh, someone, the maintainers on WordPress.org, decide to take, uh, let's say, uh, Elementor off as a draft, I, I, there, there should be some sort of backlash, right? Justified mm-hmm. or not justified, there should be some sort of backlash just because so many people rely on this for their livelihood. Mm-hmm. But at that time, it wasn't like that. Uh, you know, it was a community thing. 
uh, there were, I don't think there was, there was anyone making money from plugins at that time, definitely not from Sims. Uh, there was some big drama in the WordPress ecosystem about one, one person who tried to make a business out of that. It, it was difficult to digest. Uh-huh. Um, but it, it, it wasn't anything to the scale that we have today. Uh, they drafted it. It wasn't a big deal for anyone. But then an interesting thing happened. We, we, got, we started getting traffic directly to our website and people asking us questions. What's going on? Are you planning to abandon the project? Why did you remove uh-huh. it? But we saw that they're finding us on our site, not necessarily only on WordPress.org, but they know where to come to. So I decided, let's ask, because it was a stressful project. The amount of, because of the low conversion rate, the number of people using it for free was a lot bigger than the ones who were generating a little bit of revenue. Yeah. You know, they, they have needs. They, they have requests. And even just to read, read these requests and respond to them takes, takes effort, takes time, let, let alone maintain the product, maintain the PHP. Um, so I, I published one blog post asking people, what, how would you feel if we stayed on this website? You'd pay us. And in return, we'd do this and this and that. I listed um, a number of ongoing issues that I guarantee you that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fix. And I told them this is what you would be able to expect of us in terms of uh, quality and support going forward. And I don't remember if anyone objected to that. I remember many people leaving comments, yes, please, the $79 that you're proposing is much less than we're wasting today dealing with bugs, slowness, what have mm. you. Um, I, I just don't remember. Maybe I'm screening this out in my head, but mm-hmm. I don't remember any objections to that. Mm-hmm. And I concluded and said, I, I updated the post and said, okay, we'll need this time. So this is when, uh, the time when we committed to it, when I committed to the idea. Uh, so I told them, okay, here's a zip file with the version that we have today, which was in WordPress.org. We're not going to return WPL to WordPress.org um, <clears throat> because we didn't manage to make it work commercially. We'll stay here on this site. Until we're ready, here is the version that was there. Here is a deadline that we're setting for ourselves, and this is what we're planning to do until that deadline. Mm. And at that time, th- this new, from that new version and on, this is what we're going to ask you in terms of money. And I just remember getting support from this, from yeah. potential clients. And I then later, when we launched it, I, I was very anxious. Mm-hmm. And um, it was in one of the evenings. And I remember sitting there, okay, now what's going to happen now? Because now we've yeah. invested. Yeah. When, when we bought into the idea, then we started actually investing. We, we stopped doing anything else. And mm-hmm. we just uh, improved. We spent there for four months. The few people that were working in the business adopted everything else, and the, we made sure that we live up to our promise. We get rid of these bugs, we clean this, we pull that, and the first version we, de- we deliver, maybe it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to do what we promised. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then we were all very interested, so how is it going to play out? Are they actually going to buy? They said they'll buy. What are they going to actually do? Yeah. And they did, and I, okay. I actually uh, saw many of the first clients in the first couple of days from the people who left these comments. It was really nice. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, this t- so far to me, this sounds like the perfect, like you, you had, you know, lemons and you turned it into lemonade where like something bad happens and you were able to go, okay, we were kicked off wordpress.org for many plugins. That would be a, like a, a death sentence, right? But you took it and you realized you weren't getting that much commercial success from .org and you already have, a group of users who love your product. So you're able to, did you raise prices much? Like were the, were prices higher for people who wanted premium, the premium service? Uh, when we released it, when we had the first uh, like commercial version, mm-hmm. we asked for $79 for that. Yeah. And that was way back in 2010, I think. Uh, it's, that was a lot back in 2010. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, today, the same plugin, same plugin, plugin with the same name, which does way more, mm-hmm. costs 99 euros. So from yeah. that time until today, I would say that the price went down significantly. Yeah. Wow. 
Fantastic. I, I I guess I love hearing this because I again I think I think for a lot of software companies they would give up if they're kicked off of WordPress.org and and figure something else out if, if it didn't work. So it's 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 nice knowing that you can figure out a different business model. So so let me talk about trust. I, I think you talked about trust earlier. You you wrote this blog post and you said, hey, we're thinking about doing this, and you set deadlines for yourselves about what you'd want to do when. And you said, I, I think maybe you included some features or bugs that would be fixed or included. Yes. Did you, I, I think, <laughs> I'm going to ask you this question about trust. I think the default assumption is if you go from free to paid, that those people don't trust you anymore. But it sounds like the few people who did move trust you so much. Is is that, did, did anyone feel betrayed? Did anyone leave angry comments on your blog? It, it doesn't sound like it. No. And I think, I think that if you, if you work out a deal where everyone gets gets better off, then nobody's gonna feel betrayed. If it's a deal where you really benefit, and you kind of make it look like everyone else is also gonna benefit, they don't, they don't like it. Um, you probably get emails from subscription sets you, you you use, like from streaming music and what have you. You get these happy emails now once every few months. It says, hey, we're raising prices. Congratulations. You're going to pay more. Uh, we're yeah. so obsessed with quality and with service, and we're really dedicated. So we're raising prices, and congratulations. You, you, you're going to love us for that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, why? I mean, the music is not any better. There's nothing better yeah. with the service. Why am I going to love you for that? You uh-huh. can just be upfront, and you can say there's inflation. We're paying more for rent. We're paying more for salaries. We've tried to cut down as much as we can. But if we don't raise prices, we're going to go out of business. So that's what we're doing. I would, I, I, I would feel better about this kind of email than about these very weird emails that I'm getting every few months. Yeah. We're, we're so upset. We love you so much. That's why we're making you pay more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We care about quality. Yeah. Thank you for caring. <laughs> I get so that and that's kind of what you did with WPML is you said the product as it is right now doesn't work. So we're going to go to a premium only model and here's what you're going to get for it. That feels more direct and honest with the the user than, you know, getting a, a, a pricing update from Spotify or whoever that says we love the quality so much we're increasing prices there. Those are essentially the same thing. The same thing is happening. Similar things are happening. But I feel like yours is a much more honest and plain, a plain way of saying it, as opposed to a, a PR version of saying it. Well, it, it doesn't assume that people are stupid. Mm. I mean, you really need to assume that people are stupid in order to write kind of emails like that. Wow, I, I love that. I'm a, I, sorry, I had to jot that down as a note. It doesn't assume people are stupid. Yeah, that they can't read through your um, simple exaggeration, your fabrication, your, your spin, right? So yeah. that people don't see the way you're spinning it. Huh? I mean, if you, if you, for instance, if your, your audience keeps asking for something that is really great and is really expensive, and now you're saying, okay, I need to ask you for a little higher payment so that we can afford it and we can get it to you. Okay. And I understand the transaction going on here. Otherwise, just say the truth. I think it's going to fly better. Okay. So, so, but what, and I think the, um, the bona fides, the credentials are that basically none of your users complained, right? So you spoke plainly with your users and none of them seemed to be upset or that you were doing something wrong. Like, no, it doesn't, I, I think it doesn't feel deceptive towards anyone. Nobody yeah. wants to be deceived. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, okay, did you, okay, so let me just ask, did you, were you inspired by anyone? Did anyone, did you see other companies go from freemium to a paid model? Was there, was there some, I, some model that you were following? Well, we were among the first, maybe the first ones to ask for money for WordPress plugin. There were a few, a few cases that inspired me towards the other direction for what what not to do for the same reason for the same reasons that we're using WML, we did we, we created a, a module for drupal mm-hmm. plugins are called modules in drupal okay mm-hmm. and um uh, I, I was pretty active in the drupal ecosystem at that time as well mm-hmm. and uh seeing how they do things 
inspired me not to do the same for authors. Okay. Yeah. I, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I interrupted you. Sorry. Uh, I'll just say that I have to say learning what not to do is sometimes way more important than learning what to do. Like if you can just avoid the catastrophic mistakes, sometimes that is good, better than like learning how to do it the perfect way. Sorry. Go, go on with your, your answer. Well, I, I interrupted yeah, you. Exactly. You just said what I wanted to say. It makes okay. sense because learning from someone who succeeded is really difficult because, because you need to replicate all the conditions. And you, sometimes you don't even know what all the conditions are. It's, this is really quite difficult. But um, just learning from a specific thing that uh, people are doing and seeing the consequences of this, this is just easier. People love paying for more. It's a very human thing. Amir is one of the few people who really appreciates giving people less. And I mean that in a good way. How can you give your users just the essential features? Amir and I discuss that later in the episode. Okay, so let me let me talk about... I'm a big fan of like using models to understand. So I did a pricing change a couple years back for someone. And we did some models of this is the best case. This is the, the expected case. This is kind of the worst case. And, you know, we had different amounts of users and different price points. And, and we modeled it all out and, and tried to see where the business would be. And, and did you do any of that with WPML? Did you look at, okay, if 5% of the users who are really engaged on WordPress.org become paying members, we will have, we'll have this much money. And we can afford five engineers. Did you do any of no, like I, I, I think I, I think retention. Yeah, but I, I try to avoid that because okay. um, at the beginning you make some assumptions, and then everything is going to change quite a lot if these assumptions were just a little off. Mm. So something like two percent, three percent sounds little, but it's a fifty percent difference. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I don't have a way to just throw out these numbers with any sort of validity. Um, what what I what I try to do in WPML and in other projects as well is really think about this from the client's point of view and try to avoid the obvious things. Like people don't like to pay for what they're not using. Mm-hmm. Nobody likes that. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people prefer to pay a little more for something that they're using. And everyone hates paying even a little for something that you don't use. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other day, I was booking a flight for me and my wife, and I we now the flight's expensive uh-huh. for whatever reason I don't know. This specific flight is expensive. Okay, <laughs> but we didn't have a problem with the price of the flight. It's okay, uh-huh. we'll pay it. Usually, sometimes we get a cheap flights, sometimes it's expensive. Uh-huh. It averages out, but uh, we need one one suitcase, and I I picked the option of um, you know, on Expedia. The flight that includes a suitcase. Uh-huh. But I, I include I checked it for both of us. <sighs> so we did one. Okay. So we felt really bad. We we paid for really expensive flight. Uh-huh. And we f- we felt bad about wasting the price of one suitcase. Right? Uh-huh. So you don't really m- you understand flights fluctuate and sometimes it's uh-huh. expensive, but you really feel bad about wasting a suitcase because you've paid for something that you're not using. Yes. Yes, that is such a good example, right? You you might, you know, the same the same price going so I have some relatives in Florida. From Denver to Florida during any other time of the year is fine, but then during Christmas time when everyone wants to go to Florida, it's like two or three times as expensive, and I won't I'll feel a little bit bad paying for the expensive flight, but if I pay for the bag and I don't use the bag, you're yeah. absolutely right, I would hate that. Yes. So there's all these sort of human behaviors uh-huh. That I think are more important to understand when you're you're thinking about pricing and what you're going to give to your clients. I think these are way more important to to think about than two percent or three percent. Mm. Okay, so let me. Okay, so you you had pretty good communication with your blog post and and moving people over. You also thought, and you were very plain with them. You spoke plainly, and they no one felt betrayed or like you're doing something sneaky. But you also wanted to make sure that no one feels like they were paying for something they didn't, they weren't going to use or would, would yeah. never use. What did, did you take anything out of WPML? Was there like functions or features that no one used, and you were able to chuck them? How how did you not make people pay for something they didn't want to use? Um, we we keep doing this. Uh, we keep putting in features and taking out features because sometimes things which made out of sense seven years ago, nobody needs them today, and they're just extra luggage now. 
So this is something that we do anyway. In any system, you need to sometimes cop down unused features or at the bare minimum, separate them out into a separate plugin so that only people who need them can activate them and everyone else doesn't need to, to suffer for the extra uh, file sizes and memory. Yeah. So, so this is something that everyone needs to do anyway. You add stuff, you need to it remove stuff. There's no way that everyone's going to need everything that you've just added. Lots of engineers think that features are the be-all and end-all of software development, but Amir points out that there's something far more important than just the features. Listen on to find out. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you for a second. So having worked for a couple different WordPress plugin companies, it is very hard to remove features. And the smart way to do it is to move it into a separate plugin that people can auto down. <laughs> there's some smart ways of doing it now, but this is back in 20, around 2010, right? No, so I'm, talking, I'm, I'm okay. talking about things that we've been doing continuously since then. Okay. At that time, what we, I was, what we were focusing on is get rid of bugs. There mm. were a few bugs that we Got did it. not manage to deal with and that were pretty nasty, nasty things. Uh -huh. And it, it required the, the, the time and attention from developers to actually understand what's going on here and come up with a good solution. So the main focus of that release was get rid of bad bugs and I, I, I don't think that I you know, learned this all in an aha moment. This is something that was pretty clear, I think, from day one of doing anything, uh -huh. that uh, stability is more important than features. Hmm. Because the last thing that you want for yourself or that our clients want for themselves is that something which is working and you, you've moved on. You're no, no longer working on it. You finished that project, you delivered, you got paid. Yeah. And now it stops yeah. working spontaneously. Nobody likes this. Yeah. I, think that, I think that there's nothing that compares to that, okay? In, in any product. Yeah. Uh, but especially in something like this. Um, so this is something that I understood quite early on in the project, that stability is pretty important here. And it goes together with security, obviously, because you've left a a hole that someone can just break into someone else's site due to, you, to, to your mistake, that, that, that's not going to work for anyone. Um, and <clears throat> with this in mind, uh, we worked from, from, the, from the time when we made the project commercial and until now to remember what are the core things that clients need of us. And uh, stability and security were the top. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I didn't, uh, thinking about, so I think WPML is so, um, the, 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 the product itself, if it stops working, like people can't even read the website. You know what I mean? Like if a contact form stops working, yeah. people can't send you messages. That's annoying, but maybe you only get one a month or one a week. But if people can't read the website, that's such a fundamental yes. issue that stability is so important. Yes. It needs to be there. And, and people will notice immediately if it breaks. Yes. That's wild. Okay, so let me let's talk about the. Um, well, actually, hold on, let me just go back a second. Was there anything else that you sort of changed about how you sold? Because you you so you sold WPML WPML on your own site. Was there anything else that you, like did you position or have a, a, a? Did you highlight different features once you once you did, made the transition to premium only, or was it well, still kind if, of the same product? No, if you'd go to our website today, you'd find uh, three main points on the, at the top of our site, uh -huh. which I wrote at the time when we, we went commercial, and it hasn't changed. Wow. It's, uh, being uh, stable, being compatible, and being reliable. That's it. Fantastic. Uh, there's something simple about your business model, which I think people like. Let me... Um, did you learn any... So let's talk about the transition. So did you learn any lessons, both positive and negative, about transitioning from freemium to premium? Is there um, something that you can share that'll guide someone else who might want to do something similar someday? Um, I think or, or mistakes to avoid. <laughs> um, yeah, being being realistic is really good. Hmm. Uh, not making too many assumptions is also really good. Uh, being in direct contact with your clients and actually listening to what they have to say is really good. You don't have to automatically accept everything that they say. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand them. You have to understand why they're saying it. Too many times, people consider their clients as enemies. Like, clients are attacking us. Uh, clients are trying to hurt us, whatever. No, there's no way. Clients are not your enemy. Generally, in this ecosystem, you have very little, very few enemies. Okay? Yeah. 
Uh, we don't have enemies. It's not a zero-sum game. You know? mm. um, feeling defensive about what your clients are telling you is really bad. It makes you not, not hear, not understand them. If a client keeps badgering you, keeps nagging you about something, there's a reason. I mean, there's a cost to this client to write all these emails to you. It, it takes time. It takes effort. He's doing it because there's a reason. And the reason is not today I want to make a male's life miserable. First, I think it's a human, be- human behavior. Um, it's a psych- basic psychological thing. We, we feel threatened. Mm. And uh, it's very built-in mm. uh, responses in us that, that make us behave before we really digest the situation, before we think about that. Um, I think it's pretty natural. But then we, we don't have to do it. Yes, we're built to do that, but we don't have to do it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that when, when you realize that this person, he needs something for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's something which I have and can help him. And all, he, all he's trying to do now is use whatever methods he has to get me to give him what he needs. I think this yeah. changes to the better the way you understand the situation. Yeah, there is. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of like why people, because people definitely do sometimes really don't like customers. And maybe it's like, maybe it's, I think, so having worked for some WordPress companies in the past, you know, if you sell a plugin for $20, which, and you know, our, our industry should have raised its prices years ago. But if you sell something, something to someone for $20 and then they want this like custom feature, it's like, hey man, you're paying 20 bucks a year. I can, I can fix bugs. I can make sure it works right. but I, I can't build new feet. There are some customers who are very demanding for a very tiny amount of money, um, but they, right. but it's still probably a good idea to listen to them and understand the problem. And then maybe someday in the future, make that a separate feature or a separate plugin that they could buy. That's an yeah. add on to your existing stuff. Like that's what you should be doing is, Hey, I can't do this for $20 a year, but we can put it on development roadmap. We can build it one off for you as a, as a, as a premium thing. We, there, there's yeah. ways of like, being more symbiotic with your customers. Yes, but you determine the pricing of your product. Yep, yep. You determine what's written in your terms of service. Yep. You determine your support policy. You determine your development roadmap. The client is not forcing you into anything. Yep. It's not his fault that um, you set very low pricing that doesn't allow you to become profitable. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm learning a lot here. This is uh, uh, sometimes I think I'm going to learn about growth tactics and the latest software marketing trend. And I feel like we're talking about like business fundamentals in this episode, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, can I jump back to something that Please. you asked about and I forgot? Please. So at the beginning, we had this attempt. We also had clients who were very support heavy. Uh huh. And we tried for a few months to offer premium support. Mm-hmm. Okay. So everyone got to use WPL for free, but if you wanted to have uh, better support, you'd pay us something. Mm-hmm. We tried that one. We tried different things. We don't know what's going to exactly work. Mm-hmm. We tried that, and that did not work at all, not even close oh. to working. Now, uh, when that happened, we got into the same mindset of clients are tra- trying to take advantage of us, are trying to exploit us. Um, they do all sorts of manipul- things that appear to be manipulative. Clients would ask us a free question, and then when we told them that they need to pay in order for us to work on that, then they went into a shaming campaign against us on Twitter, where it's public or Facebook. So it's not like every business model that you come up with is going to work, but there's always a reason. Mm -hmm. The interesting interesting thing is that when something does not work, there's a reason behind it. And I think that the productive thing to do is to try to understand the reason. What's making yeah. it not work? Yeah, there's still a, there's still a problem in the software that's making someone upset, and maybe they're not handling their upset in the right way, and maybe you need to have better support policies, terms of service written down, etc. But also, if you can solve the core fundamental issue, this all this goes away. Or instead of having fifty angry clients a year, you have three, and then that's that's just not a, such a smaller problem to deal with. And and for us, when 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 we were in this situation. When I set myself down for a few hours, I looked at the actual requests that these clients are, are sending to us, the free and the paid ones, and I tried to understand better what's going on here. 
mm. and it was pretty easy to like, actually understand the reasons. But in order to do this, you have to be thinking to yourself, yeah. why is this not working? Before mm. you, you go and fix it, you, try, you, you need to understand first, why does this not work today? I think that makes a lot of sense. So uh, you, you've tried freemium, you've tried premium. Can you give us, um, is there anything you miss about being on wordpress.org? Is there anything that, um, that, that, you can def- that you definitely wish you could have still being a p- premium product, but not having that free marketing channel? It, it was over a decade ago, mm-hmm. and today things are different. Mm-hmm. So um, what I missed at that time, I don't think applies today. And I know for sure that getting people to be aware of what you're doing is extremely important, and it can be extremely expensive as well. I think that we should all be uh, we should all be feeling very lucky about being in the WordPress ecosystem. That at least uh, the awareness part is not so difficult in our, inside our ecosystem. You're right. We do not need to pay for um, TV ads. Yeah. Or Super Bowl ads in order for people just to know that we exist. Yeah. We don't need to go to very expensive conferences, blow, blow off hundreds of thousands of dollars just to be on the map. In other ecosystems, where, which are more disconnected and they're less a community thing, uh, just passing this first door, getting people to, to be aware of your existence, that is difficult. Yes. So, and I think that uh, the community resources, uh, they're, they're very valuable. All these community resources we take for granted, um, they're, they're, they're this, okay? Not just the WordPress repository, the whole thing, the, the WordCamps, people mm-hmm. talking with one another. Um, it's important. And by the way, it did not exist in other uh, free open source content management systems. And they weren't half as successful as WordPress. They had this little up and then down, and that's it. The product, the yeah. product vanished. Yeah. How do you? So how do you get your? How do you get? How do you get awareness for your product today? Since you're not on .org. Yeah, but WP is pretty pretty old and established, and many okay. people just know it because of its large user base. Is so there the a flywheel feed, now? Like once you get to a yes. certain size, it yeah, it, the, the it propels awareness. Big. Yes, yes. Today it feeds itself, but this is not a recipe for someone else entering the business today. Mm-hmm. So right. what's worked for us from the beginning with WPML before we were the size that we are today, I uh, was working with, with partners. I think that is a very, very cost-effective and also constructive thing because in order to have a, web, a website working on WordPress, someone's going to have to use various tools together on one site. Uh, it's very rare to see a, a commercial WordPress site with uh, two plugins. Mm-hmm. Very rare. Yeah. Um, and what what our clients want to get from us is that all these disconnected things would magically work together. Yeah. So by working with partners, you actually build uh, value for your clients. Yes, there's a very nice marketing opportunity here. I'll tell my clients about you. You tell them about me. Mm-hmm. But there's, you're also building value. You're making these mm-hmm. two things actually work together. You're just, not just writing blog posts. Right. So I think cre- creating value is always a nice thing. Yeah. Again, another core business, just core business ideas. Like how do you, how do you, creating value sounds like you're, you're just very customer focused. You're very user focused on making sure that they're getting something from you. And then you ask for money in return. Yeah. I think I like that way of thinking about thinking about creating value for people first and then asking for money as opposed to trying to extract, you know, as opposed to trying to extract as much money from someone as possible. That feels antagonistic to our, to our earlier point. All right. I, I, I feel like I'm rambling now. So Amir, let's go uh, one last question here. Time. If, if we're going to go back in a time machine, what is one thing you'd change about the, the transition from again, freemium to premium? Um, I would spend even more on that. You'd spend even more. Yes, uh, I because we delivered on what we wanted, but still it took us a long time in order to have a version that we were really, really happy with. So we solved all the issues that we originally identified, which were the most expensive issues. But in retrospect, uh, if there had been more competition to WPM at that, at that time, I'm not sure it was enough. It would have been enough. 
it worked for us because the comp- competition was so weak. Mm. But I, I think that uh, when you understand that you're going to make something your business, your livelihood, yeah. give it a little push. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh... It also just seems like standards have risen in in the world. I mean, especially in software, but in the world in general. And you can't push out. Um, I think in 2010, you can push out a mediocre plugin, and and people will be happy with it because um, that was the best that was available in 2010. And now in 2023, that's just not the case. We've we've had so much software development. There's so many alternatives on different yes. systems. You have to be high quality now. Got yes. it. I like that. Amir, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. Definitely. It was a pleasure to talk with you today, Patrick. It was absolutely wonderful. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed Amir's insights, like and subscribe so that we can carry on enticing awesome guests with amazing entrepreneurial journeys to join us here on the show. If you're on the Plugin.fm website, hit subscribe for early bird access to our future content. Or just share the episode on your socials so we can get the word out to help fellow entrepreneurs on their journeys too. Plugin.fm is brought to you by Freemius, your all-in-one payment, subscription, and taxes platform for selling software plugins, themes, and software as a service. If you're struggling to grow your software revenue, send a note to contact at freemius.com to get free advice from Freemius's monetization experts. My name is Patrick Rolland, and thanks for listening to Plugin.fm. <laughs>